Thank you, thank you. How's everyone? Okay. Are there any questions or comments from anything? So in terms of administrative things, we decided that for, so tomorrow you're going to present. We expect that you have a 10, 15 minute presentation on, on your research project. We would like to know if anyone changed topic We'll go through your uh, proposals that you sent on Sunday and Monday, so we are not completely lost at the moment you present, and try to give you very thorough feedback on Friday. But the, the, what we decided also is that we want you to build like a peer group, like, like a cohort that will be able to work and collaborate in the future. Um, so it, it might be good to assign, I, we decided that we are going to assign a discussant for, for your paper or your presentation. So each of you will present tomorrow and I'll send you the spread Excel sheet with who has to comment on who on Friday. So I guess the dynamics is that you, you do presentations tomorrow and on Friday we give you feedback but the assigned discussant gives you um, the comments that they thought were, were important to incorporate in your research. So I'll send it tonight so you, are, you know very well who to pay attention, very close attention <laughs> to uh, tomorrow and take notes and give them thorough feedback on Friday. All right? Are there questions? Okay. Uh, yes, just a quick one. The presentation will entail the problem and the research objectives only. I Yes, some of you have different levels of development, so think that you have from 10 to 15 minutes. I know that sounds like a long time, but sometimes it's not. And I guess the goal here, we have been trying to make sure that you have a very well-defined research question. But we understand that at this point, maybe that's not the case. And, and part of the goal of Friday is to give you feedback and try to push you in that direction. Um, so you could incorporate some kind of motivation, uh, like the way we have been trying to do it. Uh, like someone observes this, like, and why is it that we observe this phenomenon? So they went ahead and tried to research it. So you can insert the motivation, the research question, and then try to propose your hypothesis. Like the way I'm going to explain this phenomenon is by doing X using these uh, possible, testing these possible hypotheses using these variables, focusing on these variables. And other people have tried to deal with similar issues like this one, this one, this person, and this scholar has use that other uh, explanatory variable, but we, I think that this is what contributes mostly to what I'm observing. Does that make sense? Okay, great, thank you. All right, so yesterday we were um, finishing this, um, finishing Putnam and trying to, to introduce this concept that he got famous for, social capital, and we started uh, giving a definition to what is it that social capital means. So I told you how in Italy he decided that membership to the, to the, the following associations was a way of trying to measure um, social capital along with three other variables. So membership to sport clubs, uh, associations that provide leisure time, cultural and scientific activities, music and theater, technical economic health and social services was one way of um, starting construct how is it that people get together and discuss different issues and I guess he thinks that the more spaces like these 
society have, the, the different societies that he's studying have, the more instances they'll have to debate and, and discuss. And maybe that's also a, a channel via which that will allow for those citizens to contest and make accountable um, the government that they live under. And I ask you to think about what are the African associational groups that you can think that could be conducive to that kind of, um, I don't know, democratic spaces. So I don't know if any, any of you thought about that. Or there are none. <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> I don't know. This is it, it, so it's found in Tanzania. Uh -huh. uh, we have women groups, uh -huh. like the the group of women, and they are in a group to you know raise funds to support each other when issues come up. Maybe somebody's sick, somebody's died, there's a wedding or something like that. So they usually have a group and they meet maybe once a month and you know discuss those things and you know put together money oh, so okay. yeah i don't know if it's in kenya or something like that yeah. it's very they, popular in tanzania do they have like a special name or like traditional sort of role or or this is a decision that women decided to get organized and do this yes yes yeah just they just organize and help each other okay. in social matters so okay. th there are many development. Some even have constitutions. The group have a constitution, okay. like this and this. We do this. If this happens, they have like laws and regulations. But it's in, they are informal groups. They are not okay. really formal. They're inf informal. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 I think now the government is starting to formalize these groups, put them in a, you know, like registering them, okay, because so they become so popular. So they rec they recognize that these organizations could be like powerful to help. Like, like a way to develop the communities that they are embedded and, and maybe, no? Or, yeah. I mean, why is it that the government is trying to formalize that? I don't know, mainly because of issues concerning with business, because these groups, most of the time, they have a business together or in order oh, to I acquire see. loans. So, like, a group is like kind of a collateral for the member of the group oh, to acquire loans somewhere. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that could allow for these women to become like economically independent by using like using the power of like women acting collectively that gives the government some kind of formality to that group and okay, that's interesting. Yes, can you remind me your name please? My name is Ruth. Okay, Ruth. Yes, uh, just to add on what you just said, in Kenya, the informal ones, the, we call them, you have, they have a Swahili name of Chamas. Chamas, But okay. uh, generally, we have those uh, groups that for the, for the youth, for the women. I don't know about men. Maybe my <laughs> friend will com comment on that. But we, we have a youth self-help group that mm -hmm. are registered even with the government and even for the women. So there's uh, the funds that are normally given by the government to the youth and to the women, and they use such registered groups to 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 access the funds. In fact, I belong to one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but these are, okay. So one question: These are initiatives that come from like the 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 grass like grassroots initiatives. Okay, I think that's important because I guess in a way. Lots of these associations that he quotes are organized based on what the society decided they wanted to do instead of the government saying like, oh, let's open a sport club here and let's see if people join them. I think it's very important to make that. It's very different the type of social capital you might get from an association that is formed from grassroots levels to the one that is top down. So, okay, thank you, Ruth. Okay. Uh, Cecilia, sorry. Yes. So yesterday I heard you talking about the Nigerian case of clan, clans, they are being clans. And um, they, they are also there in Kenya, mm -hmm. in certain communities where 
the, the, their structure is built on plants and they're able to actually, uh, um, is it mobilize themselves uh, in clans and actually even elect people and even negotiate, like in a county. Uh -huh. They go maybe even to the governor and they say, you know, people in our clan haven't gotten jobs. We also, we also significant voters in this county mm -hmm. and we need jobs. So it's like a very, very informal kind of association, but it's there based on kinship and clanism. So I it see. is there. Mm. So who belongs to these clans? Like people from same ethnic groups? Yes. Okay. Yes, but it varies so much in Kenya. There are certain ethnic groups that they are not very much into clans, and the others that are solely into clans, like they have very well-defined clans, such that even democracy is sometimes negotiated. I it is see. the elders who decide that we are going to front this person to be our leader. So people just have to accept. So okay. it does happen. So there are, gr so in, your, in the way you're describing it, there are ethnic groups that are important and they organized along ethnicity uh, links. Yeah. But these clans have other ways of, of organizing in a yes. way, or like membership. Yes. Do you know which are like the criteria to, to say I belong to this clan and not this other one? Or? It's kinship. Basically, kinship. you're just born, wherever you're born, you know which clan you belong oh, to. See. And there are clans that are more powerful, like they have more numbers than others. I so see. you'll find if you, have, if you belong to a very small clan, chances of having a leader in that area becomes very difficult. I see. Yes. Okay. And so it is there. Okay, great. So, okay, so these are a few examples of social capital in Africa. But I guess this is, I mean, if you think about it, it could be interesting to try to have a different perspective on what Putnam is presenting and how is it that we understand social capital in Africa, no? That, that could be one thing, interesting thing to follow, like pursue. But going back to Italy, so he combines membership to these associations with the following, with other variables, like preference voting. So here, um, what he is trying to capture is that if you have a preference for a particular candidate in a particular uh, political party, that means that you, or that suggests that you have established with that politician a uh, patron-client relation and patronage. And, and I guess that's not seen as something terribly positive because you, the expectation is that you're giving support to that politician at the expense of, ex, like you're expecting something back from that politician, not basically contributing to um, the society in general. Then he includes referendum turnout, which, is, which he considers that is free of patron-client factors because if you show up to a contest or have an opinion or vote on a particular issue, instead of staying at home, if you're a person who participates actively making decisions about what needs to happen in your community, that saving minded, mindedness and that, that's a positive aspect of the level of social capital that you and your community have. And also how much uh, readership do you have in the news? Like how, I guess how interested um, are you in public events or politics in general in, in uh, about the issues that are happening. So he mixes these three with the ones that I just showed, and he builds uh, this index, again, um, it's very messy in a way because he's including, it's like a big soup of a lot of things and at the end <laughs> you don't know what it is that you're getting. But uh, they, the civic community index is composed by those four type of variable, so preference voting, and he collected this data from 1953 to 1979, referendum turnout, 1974, 1987, uh, how much people read the newspapers, 1975, and the membership of um, sports, or the lack of cultural and sports association in 1991. So we see that um, when you organize it, um, you, you can see that uh, there's, I don't know how to interpret this, like on average there seems to be a large 
clientelistic network, but I guess that's driven by the municipalities in by the community by the yes by the regions in the south. Um, but they are highly correlated in the same way the previous indexes were highly correlated, and that's exactly what the t table at the second uh, part shows. Um, and now this is the graph of those um, indicators. So again, it, it, we repeat the same story, right? Like the least, the, the, the regions with the least civic community index are again at the bottom of Italy, and in the north has the most civic um, comp um, index uh, score. So again, bad things seem to come together and good things come together. And at the end of the day, like, I mean, it's, it's funny how sometimes you can summarize books or papers only in one image. So if you have to learn anything about Putnam, the only thing that, I mean, I'm, I've been unfair, the book is very interesting, we should, <laughs> you should read the whole thing. <laughs> but if you have to give a message to a friend who asks you what is this book about, I guess this is the message, where you estimate the correlation between that index of civic community, so meaning having higher levels of social capital, are positively correlated with the institutional performance of, of the regions. So we see that the correlation is positive, um, and I guess and I guess the correlation, it looks quite strong, and I'm guessing it's statistically significant because it's quite strong. Now, um, so this is a question, I, I tried to suggest this yesterday on it's hard to know what causes what here, right? It's hard to know whether good government is what precedes economic modernity. Is it economic modernity what precedes high levels of social capital? Or social capital is what precedes good government? Like, it's hard to establish that causal relationship. And when you're looking for publishing in a top journal, um, this is something that you have to be very clear about <laughs> and to be able to sell with a, defi with a definitive answer or like at least to offer 1,000 ways to show that, w that what you're trying to argue is what is basically explaining what you're trying to offer. So he does not do that. He, he doesn't tell us what is causing what. But I mean, in a way, we shouldn't, in this case, we're not going, people are not going to give you a break when you try to send a, a paper with, without a causal identification. But that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be flexible about asking for interest, interesting questions, even if we don't have the definitive identification strategy. So it, it, this is to motivate you to think about interesting research questions, and eventually we'll get, and I think the papers that we are going to present in, in the next uh, days are going to show you that there are different ways of dealing with causality, and this is a matter of just thinking what is the best fit to do your research question. So don't get discouraged about not having the answer right away. This, these are things that we will have to work through, okay? Okay, so this is, okay, that, that's my bit. Okay, then James is back. Yes, I, I like talking, this, the statistic I like here is that even though, as Professor Bautista was saying, um, can we put the next slides on, the slide three? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, Putnam never really, s he tells a story, but he never sorts out this issue of causality. There's some work on that. We could talk about that if people are interested. Uh, there's a couple of papers that have tried to get at the caus causality between social capital uh, and, and, and these governance outcomes. But, but, but the book has been fabulously influential. I said it's, it's cited 53,000 times on, on, on Google Scholar. That means it's a very exciting piece of research and people find it inspiring. It's a great question, there's fantastic measurement. Uh, so you know, this is just to reinforce what we've been saying, which is that the most important thing is the, is the question. If you have an exciting question, then you, research it the best way you can. And Putnam 
you know, he's not an economist and he didn't really know how to do this properly, but it's still a brilliant book. Yes, so let's, let's, you know, and yesterday, Ambrose, you were complaining about how little data I had. Look how little data he has. <laughs> so, and he has far more citations than me. Well, okay, so the slide, the three, the three, not this, the, the, other, the other PDF, the AERC lecture three, please. Okay, great. Okay, so let me start with a picture. So remember, uh, we were talking about Kimuli Kassara's paper, and it was a, it, she ended up finding something quite puzzling, that, that this ethnic match between the particular agricultural producers and the president didn't go the way she thought it was she thought it would go. So this maybe is more like what she anticipated. So this is, a, this is night light at Gabadolit, you know, where President Mobutu had his, you can tell, I, you can already tell I'm obsessed with President Mobutu from the, the class so far. So, so, so this is where he built his famous palace, you know, and uh, in Gabadolit. Um, and you can see he's in, still in power in 1992. It's very bright. This is night light from satellite imagery. 1996, he's still in power. He loses power in 1997. 1998, you can see that things are getting a bit dimmer. By 2005, you know, the power's almost out in Gabadolit. Uh, so this is more like what, you know, people, she had in mind, I think. And, you know, this goes to the discussion of, well, but what instruments are you actually using to help, you know, your supporters? Maybe you're not using agricultural pricing. Maybe you're using... You know, Professor Bautista was yesterday talking about maybe you're using jobs or contracts or electricity or there's lots of different instruments. So that's one way of thinking about what she what she found. So this is I, I sort of like this picture. So 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 you know um, uh, so today we're going to talk kind of more systematically. We're going to use three papers, three fantastic papers uh, about development in Africa. Uh, to talk about these research designs more, some of these research designs, canonical research designs more systematically. And they're all in the context of what, what people call observational data, okay? So, so by observational, observational research, I just mean research that doesn't use some explicit randomization. So next week, we're gonna talk about explicit randomization, uh, but, we're going to argue, and the three scholars, you know, the scholars of these papers argue that, you know, yes, it's observational data, but there's a natural experiment. So there's a kind of naturally, there's a natural situation, a naturally arising, a real world source of variation that we can interpret as if it was an experiment. Okay, so, so I was giving you an argument yesterday like that when I was talking about the Kuba Kingdom. I was saying, you know, we can think of this formation of the Kuba state. Uh, as a sort of basic exogenous innovation in political institutions, and then you get this naturally occurring variation in political institutions. So we're going to see a lot of that today. Okay? But again, we're going to be talking about methodology quite a lot, but I want to emphasize, or we want to emphasize, that the most important thing about these three questions is not the uh, these three papers is not the methodology, it's the question. Okay? They all have fantastic questions. Okay, so, so the first paper, you know, by Nana Wanchikon is going to look at the kind of legacy of the slave trades in Africa on trust today. Okay, so that's going to be related to social capital, as we'll see. The Loza Montero paper uh, looks at the impact of colonial commercial concessions uh, on long-run development outcomes in Africa. So those are two papers about you know, why is Africa distinct and how do we think about the history and the kind of processes of development that have shaped Africa, pre-colonial and uh, colonial. Uh, and the third paper is something very different. Again, it's using African materials by Sanchez de la Sierra, a colleague of ours uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, actually, Eduardo Montero is also a colleague of ours at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, uh, he's interested, he's using African materials from the Eastern DRC but he's not interested in a particular African question. He's interested in the broad question of social science about the nature of state formation. Okay, so, so, uh, uh, but nevertheless, having emphasized the questions, 
these three we pick these three papers because each of them illustrates a particular type of research design, which is kind of one of the canonical research designs you know, that people use to tackle this issue of causality. Okay, the first one, the Nunn and Wanchikon paper, Leonard Wanchikon is, a, is a, he's from Benin, uh, teaches at Princeton in the political science department, uses an instrumental variable estimation strategy to look at the impact of historical slave trade on trust today. So that's a, we're gonna see a bunch more instrumental variable paper, but, but, but that's, that's a kind of very canonical research design to tackle this issue of causality. The Loza Montero paper uses a design which is possibly even more fashionable at the moment, actually, which is called regression discontinuity design, okay? And that uses sort of kind of, it's gonna use a random placement of, you'll see when I talk about it, it's gonna use, basically it's gonna argue that these colonial concessions, they had well-defined geographical territories and the we can think of the boundaries as being basically as if random. Okay, so we can exploit this discontinuity at the boundary of these colonial concessions to look at the causal effect of those concessions on long-run development outcomes. And then Sanchez de la Sierra uses a so-called difference in difference design. So these three things will come up a lot. That, you know, uh, uh, and I think like one of the ways, what, you know, what we'd like you to come out of this class in some sense is questions. It's about the questions, it's about the questions. And when I have a good question, I, I want to answer it in the best way I can. And the way to think about that is, how do I map it into one of these different strategies? You know, and there's not that many. You know, that's the good news. Uh, so, and these are some sets of three. If you're not explicitly randomizing something, these are the three most popular and most commonly used uh, research designs. So I have papers with, I have papers with all of these. Uh, okay, so, so he's gonna look, this so-called difference in difference uh, strategy is going to come from the fact that looking in the eastern Congo, some places have coltan mines, some places have gold mines. Uh, there's going to be a huge exogenous shock, an increase in the price of coltan, and he can look at the difference in the difference between what happens in with a cold with a coltan mine, without a coltan mine, before and after the shock to the price of coltan. So that's a sort of classic difference and difference design. Okay, so so so. So now back to Professor Bautista, which is good because my hearing aid battery just died. Yeah. All right. So I think be, I think I like I I know I don't know how comfortable you are about when I ask questions, <laughs> but I like to do that to push you. So this is partly the motivation of the paper by Nathan Non and Leonard Watchigan. So what is so distinct about this map. So the, the variable that it's been plotted here is trust around the world. And this is uh, from the World Value Survey, the round from 2014. And the darkest color means there are high levels of trust to the question. So people agreeing with the statement, most people can be trusted. So the darkest, the blue, the higher the level of trust, and the yellowish, like more pale color, means very low levels of trust. China has very high levels of trust, right? And, and Scandinavian countries have very high levels of trust. Australia. Huh? Kenya. <laughs> yeah, like I am from Colombia, so <laughs> we don't trust anybody <laughs> apparently. <laughs> but you have good reasons not to <laughs> do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are very. You're noticing exactly that that. The, ma the, the data that has, the, the map that has data on Africa seems to show that Africa has very low levels of, of trust, right? So in, I guess this is partly the inspiration of, of this um, paper. And I think maybe it could be that there is no difference. It's not what? 
actually the question is whether there is very low levels of trust in in Africa or that there is that there is in that data to show that there is or how the data was collected I guess they tried to run these surveys in a very standard way to try to capture more or less the same response. So it, I guess it, the, the data is pretty comparable, I would have thought. Yeah, we have to Okay, Africa. so I guess the next, yes, yeah, so this slide shows Afrobarometer, which is another survey that shows in a similar way levels of trust, but this is the data within Africa. And the question that people, that people were asked is, generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you must be very careful dealing with people? So the blue, the turquoise blue shows most people can be trusted and the purple color is you must be careful. So where is Kenya? <laughs> yeah. Tanzania, so in Tanzania, on average, like people, 10% of the people who were surveyed, huh? you think that's true? So more or less, so, so are you all Kenyans? So you, uh, you're from Tanzania, so you, you basically don't trust each other in that table. <laughs> that's, that's the conclusion. <laughs> I think that... Tanzanians don't trust us. I think uh, the question really is even whether if you pick somebody at uh, Tradom on the Nairobi streets and you start asking them a question, they are not interested in answering a question because the first thing that comes is suspicion. Why, why are you asking me the question? Or even if I answer the question, you are really not interested in what I'm asking. I mean, your post, I, I, so there are different ways of, of thinking about your comment. People who do surveys have all of these elaborated strategies in order to get good and good quality data from the survey. So they train people and they try to make sure that the data that they are trying to get is very good. So they are not going to show up randomly in a street and ask like, okay, so do you trust your neighbor? Do you trust this person? Because that's not like, they, I'm sure they do it in a more <laughs> sophisticated way than just showing up and asking. But I guess, yes, do you want to say something? Yes. About, yeah, okay. No, 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 you say. Yeah, which is, these questions are, I mean, it, what Professor Baptiste is saying is right, uh, but, but there's a question about whether this is the culturally relevant way to uh -huh. investigate. You know, so, so, so people take these questions and you know, they want to ask the same questions yes. in India and the Philippines and Canada and Kenya and Tanzania. But those are very different cultural contexts. And, and they want to use the same question because they say that makes things comparable. But 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 I think you know. So in the, if you in the United States, there's, there's you know people would say in development economics, it's a sort of stylized fact that you know trust is very low in Africa. And I think there's a real puzzle here because if you think about what Professor Bautista was saying about Putnam, yeah, Putnam talks about a, the oh, Putnam 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 talks about you know. So we have a slide on this, I yes, guess. Yes, but, yes. But, but, Putnam talks about all this associational life, and that's associated with trust. But associational life is off the chart in Africa, in my personal experience, relative to the United States, for example. People here in Africa are much more involved in all sorts of associations and groups, and they may be traditional, they may be you know, created. So, so there's a real puzzle here about associational life and trust, and whether this is the right way to measure trust, the right mm -hmm. way to, th to conceptualize how Africans think about this. I think that's actually a fantastic research question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I guess, no, I was going to say that, that perhaps this idea of how, like Putnam developed this idea of social capital, and you assume that when you have high levels of social capital, you should have high, high levels of trust as well, because you build community with these people, you grow up with them, you have lots of things in common and then you, you will end, like by definition you end up trusting them more than people who are outside that particular group. Um, but there's also the culturally relevant question on how is it that you define trust or why do you, I don't know, like, yeah, okay. Um, but okay, so
let's, let's think that that's a good measurement of trust around the world. And that's a still an interesting thing to, or like a, a, an interesting puzzle to, to answer. And this is exactly what Nathan and what Juan Chicon are trying to understand. Why is it that trust levels are so low in Africa? And Nathan Nunn has come that we are observing. Um, and in other work he has shown, and I'm going to show you how is it that the, he collected the data, but he shows how uh, the slave trade has consequences on the economic prosperity of these African countries. So the higher the levels of slave trade that these countries experience, the lower levels of um, economic prosperity. But, but then now they want to find out how is it that, or like what could be potential mechanisms by which the slave trade could have affected these societies and therefore you observe the outcome that he observes in his previous papers. So they want to link slave trade and trust. Um, and I guess they think it, this is um, a, a, a very important part of the story of why is it that we observe low levels of trust in Africa because in particular the intensity of slavery was much higher and you know in a lot of dimensions unique in Africa when you compare it to different areas in from the, around the world. Okay, so I, I already showed you. I guess it would have been good to compare these with other countries, like, but, I, okay, maybe we can include that slide later. Okay, yeah. Um, I, yes, we talked about this. Um, okay, so this is exactly what I was telling you. Like, n in his PhD dissertation, Nathan Nunn established this relationship between uh, the African slave trade and economic prosperity. And he did that by uh, collecting data in an innovative way. This data was uh, in the um, in, so, in an archive, and it's the W.E.B. Du Bois data set, and he manages to construct an estimate of people who, of slaves who were taken from their original places um, and link them with a particular ethnic group. So this is how that data that he managed to put together more or less looks like. So this is the table uh, from that paper, table one, slave ethnicity data from this for the transatlantic slave trade. So he, this data collects different archives and sources. So they put together all of these sources. Uh, for example, we see that in an archive in Valencia, Spain, in between the years of 1482 and 1516, you, could, you were able to find records of 77 different ethnicities that corresponded to around 2,675 uh, slaves who were uh, brought to that particular place. And they record the type of uh, source that they had for that particular number. Um, if you go to Colombia, where I am from, it, from in 1738 to 1778, there are, there are records of 11 type of ethnicities from around 100 cases of people who ended up in Colombia. So you read the, this, these numbers in exactly the same way uh, for the rest of the, for the, yeah, uh, the table. And then now how do we, so we have the ethnicity, but what the next step that he has to do is to match those ethnicities to current countries in order to make this relationship between slave trade and the outcome that he wants to study. So um, he organizes the data using the country name, the type of trade that they have information on. So for example, uh, the, compiling this data, he's able to find that uh, from Angola, there were around 3,600,000 people um, that were um, taken away from Angola and driven and taken somewhere else around the world. From Nigeria, it was about 1,400,000. Um, from Zambia, 6,000 people. From the for the transatlantic 
trade, but in the Indian Ocean, it, it, Zambia, for example, has a much higher number, 21,000, I guess because of the geographical location. So that explains the variation in the numbers um, and, and the intensity. And this is the, the, one of the main correlations that he establishes. So um, in the y-axis, we have the logarithm of real per capita GDP in 2000, and uh, the number of people who were taken from their original place and sold into slavery, normalized by land area. And, and what is it? I mean, it's very clear the correlation. It's negative and statistically significant. As we can see, the coefficient and the standard error, we see that it's statistically significant. So that's, that's partly the, mo part, the motivation for the follow-up paper that we're going to cover in more detail. But I wanted to show you that relationship. So again, that's another great question that had not been explored. And he uh, took the initiative and collected all this data and put it in, in and he published this in a very, and where is it in the A? Yes, OK, in that top. OK. So uh, OK. So again, one of the first things, so when Nathan Non um, first did this research, this, this particular research, he um, di couldn't match uh, economic outcomes or other types of outcomes to the levels at the ethnicity. Is that, uh, yeah, it's very hard to, to, match, to match like uh, GDP per capita by ethnicity because the boundaries of the world are now different or, or or it's hard to measure that at the ethnicity level. But there are other um, type variables and sources that you can use, that you can match them into ethnicity and the boundaries. Uh, so those, so for him, they managed to find data in the Afrobarometer and the um, Demographic and Health Survey, the DHS, that it's also geocoded and has all kinds of information. So it's a very rich source of, of data that uh, could be used. And they use it um, for this particular question, but uh, it, apparently no one else has looked at other outcomes that could be matched from those two surveys. And on top of that, he uses the, something that is called the Murdoch map who was an anthropologist, and he um, constructed the ethnographic survey. Um, and, and it's basically an effort to try to build a map of Africa, but it's also it's for, the, for the world, right? Or is it just for Africa? Oh, OK, so it's an effort to try to construct the, the boundaries of every single ethnic group, but also to collect data on their different, the, the different socioeconomic characteristics of, of each ethnicity in Africa. And once you do that match between uh, the slave in intensity by ethnic group using those sources that I just presented, uh, this is the, the map that you can plot um, showing the intensity of the slave trade by ethnicity. And the, but this is the transatlantic slave trade. So here, basically, what we can see is that um, the very dark uh, black, it, that's by Congo. And what it's Congo and Angola, right? So a lot of the slaves that came uh, from Africa seem to have been um, taken from that area. But it's also, it, there's another part of very dark gray in this part of Africa. Um, and you, but you can see how the, the, the distribution is clear, right? Like, um, it's places from that are close to the coast, the ones that seem to have higher levels of intensity in the slave trade. And now, the, this is a plot on the Indian Ocean slave trade. Again, it's very intense along the coast. 
Madagascar is a country that seems to have provided lots of slaves as well. And now he goes to the first relationship that he would like to estimate, which is exactly trust, like trust as a dependent variable taken from the Afrobarometer surveys, and then the, the number of people who were taken from, from Africa to different places around the world. So uh, again, they run a simple, ordinary list of square regression. And trust is the dependent variable. And this is taken from the Afrobarometer survey, where and, and they have this by individual. And they know, because they are able, if they know where the individual um, is located, I don't know, if, do they ask ethnic group or they assume, OK. Well, the old thing, the old thing is you don't actually need the mode of math to run this regression, because, because you're, you're in the Afrobarometer. They ask about the ethnicity. Yes, exactly. So, and so they, you could have done the whole thing without the math. So the yes. Afrobarometer asks about ethnicity. So it says, oh, you know, you get to say, are you Yoruba or Igbo or Kikuyu or whatever. So then I have the data on slavery at the Kikuyu level. Yeah. I know who's Kikuyu in the Afrobarometer. I can so match you don't it without, need them without the map. The map is cool, but, but you don't need the map. Yes. <laughs> And they have the discussion on how they have 20, around 20,000 observations, like 20,100 and blah, blah. And then there are some people who responded ethnicity at their own country or didn't report ethnicity. So they dropped those 120 observations. But they still have a large number of individuals um, that reported their levels of trust and ethnicity. Uh, also in the district D of, count of country C. So those are the sub-indexes. And then they have uh, slave exports, which is the main variable of interest. And it's, this is measured at the ethnic level. Um, then you have the coefficient for um, the country fixed effects. So um, we look at only the within country variation. And then this is combined with different types of controls, right? Uh, that are, have to be at the individual level and the country specific level. Um, and they go in detail about which are the variables that they included. Um, like it, it, they understand that income is highly correlated with trust. So they try to incorporate the levels of education um, and age and gender at the individual level to try to capture uh, income. Um, and at the country level, they do similar exercises. But they include fixed effects, which is like uh, uh, the definitive way of trying to uh, get rid of possible omitted variables that are, that are driven by the particularity of the country. OK, so this is the, the first table that has the results of that estimation. So OLS estimates of the determinants of trust in neighbors. So the only question that they are asking is, how much do you trust your neighbor? And what we see is that, um, and this is using different measurements of um, the intensity of the slave um, uh, exploitation, I guess. Uh, so what we see here is that the coefficient is negative. And it, it is statistically significant in, in all of the specifications. If you take um, the coefficient and divide it by the standard error, but here they, are, they, they present three different types of standard errors. It depends on the way you cluster um, the, the, the errors. Um, so this is a, a, the, the first pass to try to convince you that there is a relationship between the intensity of, of the slave trade and trust. And they do it using different uh, explanatory variables. And at the end, they end up choosing uh, this particular measurement, wh which is logarithm of 1 plus the exports divided by the area of the ethnic uh, group. And this is going to be the explanatory variable that they use 
in in the future in in the next regression. So now they want to try to look at uh, it more consistently. How is it that this measure of a, a export a, of slave trade is correlated with different types of trust? So what changes here is the dependent variable. So they ask about how much do you trust your relatives? How much do you trust your neighbors? How much do you trust your local council? What's the level of intra-group trust and intergroup trust? And all of these measurements are included at the Afrobarometer. And what is it that we observe here? And, and the, obviously they include individual controls District, district controls, country fix effects, and they do it. A, oh, I thought you were talking. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I'm just going to make a methodological point, which was we were having a discussion yesterday with with Alex about um, how you present results, and just pointing out something here, which is that everything is designed to like focus on just one one variable, like which is the dependent variable, one dependent variable, one independent variable. There's many co controls and covariates, but it's like, yes, 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 you don't show the, co it's like suppressed. That's like, you, you want to control for those because you're worried that they might be confounders, but that's, that's the story, that's the story, that's your story you're focusing on. And it, that, that you'll see that in all the tables, in all the papers we show, that's like, uh, that's the style. Of, of the way you're presenting the results, it's also the way you're framing your question. It's very, like, research questions that have 10,000 types of possible answers are not going to go very far. <laughs> so, if anything, you should try to stick to one explanation and similar explanations that you can test, like, for robustness, in a way. So. Ideally, tomorrow we would like to see you to see you coming and saying like, I'm going to study this, and I decided that this is the main explanation. And yes, I worry about these other issues, but maybe if I control for them or if I have a different way of thinking about this, I cannot. I can definitively convince you that this is the main argument for for my answer which is exactly what not only this paper is going to do, but the, the, all the, I think all the papers that we are going to study have exactly the same uh, structure. You will only see one row of what is really important, not 10,000 things listed at the bottom of the, of the table. Okay, so again, in, in all of these estimations, what we observe is that the coefficient is negative and statistically significant, meaning that uh, the intensity, the higher the intensity of the slave trade, the less trust you observe in these um, individuals. So this is exactly what I'm, I'm saying. Like the, the results are very robust, and and then. Um, I guess the follow-up question that they have is like, why is it that these results persisted in such a in such a strong way? Um, and is so you have to acknowledge that there will be empirical challenges, and I think it, they are very good at explaining that not only in the introduction, but I guess the online appendix is full <laughs> of <laughs> of robustness tests of this and that, so. You, when you do exercises like this, you will be asked to do all kinds of robustness tests. Um, but what, what are the possible problems that you might face when you have, um, when you want to establish this kind of relationships? And this is related more or less to what uh, we presented with Putnam. Okay, so you could have, you could think that um, you could have reverse causality, like the first uh, point addresses. Like it could be true that uh, the slave trade was actually higher 
because if you don't trust people to start with, you better get rid of that neighbor that stole your chicken, or you better get rid of that relative that you don't like, and you send, I don't know, like maybe there are different motivations of, I don't like my parents, for example. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's a, but I wouldn't do that to them. But it, in, okay, it, in any case, so you, might have, you might think that low levels, initial low levels of trust might lead to higher levels of, of, of in the intensity of the slave trade. And, and then you don't know how, what, like, um, how do you... <laughs> How do you establish the, the correlation, like the causal identification? Like, how is it that you manage to say this is definitively what causes that? Um, or also you have other omitted variables that are present in the, in the countries or in the groups where you live that are also um, affecting the main explanatory variable that you're trying to test and the outcome at the same time. So how about, like Putnam argued, like do, if these communities high, have high or low levels of associational life, that also matters. So how is it that we can control or take that into account? And that also might affect the levels of slave trade that happen in those areas, um, and obviously the levels of trust. So this, yes. I'm trying to really get this argument because this is sl slave trade mm -hmm. and now we're talking about issues to do with um, trust because I want to see, n not really what to see, but I would think that um, you should see tr uh, slave trade as a commercial transaction where the issues of trust really is not, where the slave is seen as a commodity so the issues of trust don't arise here. So maybe there is something I'm missing in the whole the larger discussion here. I guess, so you are raising a good point because actually, and this is exactly the way they address, generally where there is, where in areas where there are lots of trade transactions, they have high levels of trust. So that there are, there's other, like Avner, like Avner Grive, he, he shows that for example, like, any trade transaction implies that people trust each other because otherwise it's impossible to trade things. But I guess here the trust that we're talking about um, is interpersonal trust or trust to your neighbors or trust to uh, other types of officials. <laughs> but <laughs> so it could be that it's a different type of trust, but also even if it's not a different type of trust, I guess the type of commodity that you're trading is a very different one from the usual commodity that one trades, and it has other implications. Because the issue here is, at what point are we looking at trust? Is it at the point where the slave was first of all, ex call it expelled from the community, or is no. at the point where the slave is now in the market, and therefore no, the issue of trust is This is right. trust a hundred years later. So I guess what they are trying to argue is that perhaps these communities were so traumatized and devastated by how the slave trade happened. And they have they collect like qualitative stories from different sources that there were lots of instances on how relatives, neighbors would take their friends or people like people who were sort of looking for a new place to live they, are, they you take them in your home and then you see an opportunity to sell them to in in the market so they have lots of accounts like this that this is these are things that happen at the moment where the where the slave trade was happening but now we're measuring trust a hundred and something years later right so obviously you're, you're questioning how is it that this persists for so long and how is it that they explain this persistence? And in a way, that's the right question, but I guess the, the way they want to think about this is that perhaps all of these attitudes, because these communities were so traumatized by, by this kind of deal 
then all of that persists. And this is one proof of how is it that they persist. Like they are offering empirical evidence of, on that. Is that the right answer? I think so, yes. <laughs> I, think, I think that's right. I think you know, there's a lot of uh, evidence in the historical literature that the slave trade led to sort of severe deterioration in judicial institutions also, for example. Like, you know, the famous, the, the famous case in Nigeria would be the oracle in Aro in eastern Nigeria. So there was an oracle which was used for disputes and commercial disputes. But then it became an instrument of enslavement in some sense. You know, so it got perverted. The use of the oracle was perverted from its original role into a kind of tool of enslavement. So, so, so I think that's also part, like there's a sort of persistence you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a destruction of judicial institutions, but I think, like, they, nev they never really established why it persisted for so long. Like, this is many papers like this. It's sort of, you have this very historical thing, and then you have this contemporary thing, and then what's happening in between? <laughs> so so that, that's a great, so you're asking a great question yes, there. Yes, I yeah. guess the, you're asking about the mechanism by which this persists for so long, and that's a perfectly valid question, and I don't think, I mean, they do cite works that show how that worked, but they don't seem to, I guess the way they think they are showing that is, is by showing the uniqueness of the case of Africa. When I'll go, and I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation. Yes, we want. No, but to that's that, you know you're making me think about something. So one okay. one thing that P Professor Bautista and I have been trying to do in Nigeria is talking about Aro. You know, is that the Aro people organised the slave trade in the whole of eastern Nigeria. So I think like what you're suggesting actually is something super interesting, which is there may be a very big difference. You know, depending on where you look in Africa, like in the parts of Eastern Nigeria, where that even today there are Arrow communities, for example, or there were historical slave markets, there might be a lot of trust. That's something completely different. You needed trust to do transactions. But other places, it could be very different. So there may be a lot of heterogeneity within Africa, which this empirical strategy can't look at at all. So that's a great question for us. We're actually interested in, we've been collecting information, we're going to collect information on all these Arrow settlements and these trade routes. So you, 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 you now you raised a great hypothesis that I hadn't thought about before. <laughs> yeah, I think the issue here really is the body of literature that uh, we have interacted. Okay, I've really never interacted with the literature touching on slave trade, uh, save for a few, uh, whatever, little that we read in high school, really that doesn't, we can't talk about it here. Uh, but, but I find the discussion really quite, uh, quite interesting. Because again, even when you are to look at, again, at the issues of uh, trust, then you also want to, okay, I have a business background. You also want to look at who are the suppliers of slaves from, <laughs> the suppliers of slaves from that particular region. Could they be trusted by the market where those slaves are going? So, so they are quite, but I, I, I now try to get some bearing on what the discussion is all about. Pardon my ignorance, really, I haven't. <laughs> Uh, Emmanuel Nosu. Emmanuel Nosu. His mic is, yeah, he should be speaking. You should be hearing. He's not muted, he's on. Can you type your question, please, Emmanuel? <laughs> 
seems to be speaking, but uh, even the, within the Zoom, no one can hear him. Yeah. Okay. So after putting out there some of the empirical challenges like this reverse causality, then you have to definitively show that uh, your main explanatory variable is exactly what is causing what you're observing. So in order to do that, they use um, identific I, um they, the identification strategy is instrumental variables. So what they do is that they instrument a, the a slave intensity with distance to the coast. And I guess the idea is that, as the map seems to suggest, some ethnic groups, like the, the groups, the ethnic groups that seem to have experienced the most intensive slave trade were the ones that were along the different coasts. And the ones that were further away from the coast don't seem to, like maybe the intensity was less, so maybe they want to use distance to the coast as the instrumental variable for the intensity of the slave trade. And that's exactly what they do. And, and, but when you do instrumental variables, you, um, you have to be mindful of the following uh, conditions in order to be able to argue that you're making a causal claim. So uh, the first one is that distance to the, from the coast should explain the intensity of the slave trade, meaning there is a relationship between distance to the coast and the slave trade. And um, distance to the coast should not be in itself a determinant of trust, meaning it only, the only way uh, distance to the coast is influencing the final outcome is through the slave trade. Uh, and, and this is when the exclusion restriction is satisfied. Um, and, 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 and this goes back to the point that you raised. Like other scholars have actually showed that peep areas that are closer to the coast seem to present higher levels of trust. trust. As, as you go further away, there is less trust. But this doesn't seem to be the case in Africa, at least. And, or at least in, in the case of Africa, it goes in the wrong direction. Um, and here we should find, we find that there is a positive relationship between slave intensity and trust. So this is the first stage of the, of the um, IV strategy, where they estimate slave um, exports. And this is um, at the ethnic level. But look at that, they still use, okay, so, and they, they estimated with the main explanatory variable, which is distance to the coast, again, at the ethnic level. But see how all of the covariates are exactly the same as in this equation. So they, use, they still use the individual um, characteristics of the people who answered the Afrobarometer survey, with the ethnic characteristics, with the district characteristics, with the country characteristics. And again, this is other covariates at the district country characteristics and covariates at the ethnicity level, which are important. And all of those are going to be incorporated in that first stage. So this is something very important that you also do when you're, you're doing instrumental variables. All of the covariates should be present in all of the estimations. Uh, 
Yeah. So and, and even though this this there is no var like the only variation that you observe in the outcome variable and in the explanatory variable is at the ethnic level, you still include uh, covariates at the individual district country level. Um, and now the next step is to use the estimated values of the slave exports in trust. So they, they estimate this first um, equation. They take the values that they get from slave exports based on this equation. And they do exactly this, the, the same regression as they did in the, first, in the first OLS that I presented with exports of slaves and the different levels of trust. So here they are presenting, for example, the first stage where the dependent variable is the intensity of slave trade which is one plus exports divided by the area, with the historical distance of ethnic uh, group from coast. And what is it that we observe here? The relationship is, again, negative and statistically significant. And they include all kinds of um, omitted uh, variables that uh, are important to take into account because it could be the case that the, during the colonial period um, there were different dynamics that might have shaped uh, the intensity of the slave trade. So they take that into account and they also include the ethnicity level co uh, um, or other colonial controls at the ethnic level, individual controls, district controls, country fixed effects. They include that in order to make sure that their results are, or the results they present are robust. And they convince you in a definitive way that there is a negative relationship between distance of, of the ethnic group to the coast, meaning that the further away you are, as, as this distance grows, the less intensity of slave trade you will experience. And then they use that estimation to estimate the, the different trust measurements. Uh, and here the dependent variable is individuals trust with this variable after being instrumented. And what they find is that the, these results are very similar to what they find in, the, in that first regression that I showed you um, here. See that not only the coefficients are very similar, but the, also the, the, the standard errors are also very similar. So that's something that gives them confident to, confidence to say that this is the main, or like the main mechanism why we can observe this in Africa. Uh, so now the next thing that they want to persuade you is that um, in order to persuade you that the slave trade was the definitive variable that makes people trust uh, less more their neighbors than their friends and their relatives is um, by comparing Africa to the rest of the world. So because the data, I guess the barometers have data all around the world, but uh, they use the World Value Survey, which is another source of data that will compare, that has data outside Africa on the same type of questions. And in order to show what, that, that this is the case for Africa, they, they use data from Nigeria because that's the question that they found to be comparable uh, for all the regions different, that ha contain different regions other than, than, than Africa. So they do exactly the same exercise of trying to see whether distance from the coast is a determinant on intergroup trust, for example. Uh, and they divide, the, they, they present the results for the Afrobarometer sample. And for the World Value Survey, they have the following results. Um, they, they, for, so these are countries, out, so I think they had Asia, and, and I forgot this other, so they, they call it the non-Africa sample, which included countries that are not in Africa. And I guess what is so important about this is that there is, here what they seem to observe is that 
the coefficient is negative, but it is not statistically significant. Meaning that this particularity on the relationship between slavery and, and trust seems to apply only to Africa, and therefore you can say that it was the slave trade the main driver of these results. And especially when you look at, at Nigeria compared in the same survey. Uh, okay, so that's it. Yeah. I don't know if there are questions or comments or you want to provide more the wisdom about The question is already this. here. Ah, okay, let's see. Okay, and what's he saying? I was saying that the issue of mistrust arose because of the way slave trade happened. I like the so-called modern slavery in which individuals willingly surrendered themselves for such trade. People were forced into slave trade by tricks, raids, hatred, injustice, and so on. This led to mistrust, but the worry is that apart from the pattern of slave trade, there were other factors that could have led to mistrust in Africa, which could have, have intergenerational effects on mistrust. This includes sorcery, stealing, ambushing other clans, and so on. Yeah, so, so I think that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's basically about, yeah, okay, but there's other sources of variation in the lack of trust. Uh, you know, there's many other sources of variation. So I think here it's important to see that, you know, the strategy, the strategy of presenting the research is to kind of focus on one dependent variable and one independent variable. But, but the R squared of that relationship is not one. You know, you're not claiming that that explains all of the variation. You're just claiming that it's a significant source of variation. The historical slave trade is a significant source of variation in low levels of trust today. So, so but the gen what the gentleman is suggesting is that lots of other ideas about what might also cause lack of trust. And I think that's perfectly consistent and that's all really interesting to investigate. Yeah. Moses were asking, you know, what about what about other sources of variation in trust? Like, what about oh, what about what about colonialism? You know, doesn't colonialism so distrust in Africa? And I think how do, how does how do they deal with that? Okay, well, they don't really de they don't really deal with it. Uh, they have some covariates. If you look at the paper, they try to control for it. In the same way that in the Cuba paper I talked about yesterday, we tried to control for colonialism by just controlling for the physical presence of the colonial state. So you could say that's, very, that's a very unsatisfactory way of thinking about it. So, so I think that's a fantastic piece of research waiting to be done, which is to think about how colonialism impacted African societies in a way that might have undermined trust. And here's the hypothesis we came up with. I think particular, particularly in countries like Kenya, which is a country with white settlement, where white people came, 
they expropriated people, they cheated them out of their land. You know, if one found maps of you know, the colonial land settlements, maybe every Kenyan <laughs> knows where this is, and looks at, you know, is it true today that places where English expropriated uh, Africans, levels of trust are lower, for example, than in places where the Africans were left alone? That's a really interesting hypothesis, okay? So I think this, like, like we were discussing, this is not the only source of variation. It's, a, it's an interesting source of variation, but that leaves lots of other types of topics and questions unaddressed, you know. So I think that's, 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 that's something that would be really interesting to investigate, actually. And, and, you know, there's even a research design there. So I, and, 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 and I wanted to emphasize just one more thing about da data, which we'll talk more about next week for sure, which is in this um, regression that Professor Bautista was talking about, you know, some of these covariates here are at the ethnic level. So where do they come from? Well, they come from this ethnographic atlas that she mentioned, so by Murdoch. And that's a very interesting source of information about kind of, the, you know, the institutional structure of different uh, ethnic groups. In work that I've done, which I'll talk about next week, we also augmented that a lot from a source which is called the ethnographic um, uh, survey of Africa. So that's the ethnographic atlas. But for about 30 years, a whole group of Western anthropologists wrote a series of about 50 volumes trying to do a systematic ethnographic survey of Africa. That's also a very rich, that's, not, that's all in books, it's not digitized, but it's a very, I mean, the books are, the books are <laughs> digitized, but there's no data set. You have to extract things out of it. So a few projects I've done, I'll talk about that next week. I, I've extracted ideas from this much bigger ethnographic survey of Africa. That's a very rich source of information about, uh, about African society. Um, so, so, and then we had all sorts of other interesting discussions also. So I think like, this is a good topic. We should, we'll talk more about this next week. Okay, so, so, now, you know, so now talking about colonialism, uh, um, let me just say, you know, also trust, there's lots of sources of variation in trust. Um, the slave trade also no doubt had many other types of impact on African society. So you remember that w I mentioned briefly that Professor Bautista and I are trying to do this work in eastern Nigeria on why are women so empowered, you know, and how come so many institutions of, you know, female empowerment, you know, which have no analogy in Western society are there in Eastern Nigeria, but actually Eduardo Tesso um, uh, wrote a paper looking at the impact of the slave trade on gender roles, mostly in West Africa. You know, why would, that, why would there be a kind of causal connection? Well, men were much more heavily slaved than women were, so it creates this disbalance in the gender ratio. Men disappear, women take on all sorts of tasks, uh, so actually he shows using Nathan, using the same data that we just looked at, using this data on slave intensity by ethnicity, that there's a positive correlation between the, between the, the historical intensity of slavery and female labor force participation today, which is a pre pretty interesting correlation. So, so if you're interested in like, thinking about the consequences of the slave trade, this is another very nice paper. So there are there's a small literature looking at that, but, but looking at colonialism hasn't been done at all, I think, I, and, and so that's super interesting. Okay, so talking of colonialism, let me talk about, that was the slave trade, that was instrumental variable regression. Uh, this is the paper by Sarah Lowe's and Eduardo Montero, looks at colonialism, uh, the impact of a very particular colonial institution. You know, so I think, you know, to think about empirically about colonialism, you have to kind of unbundle colonialism and think of col colonialism was all sorts of different things. It was land expropriation, it was different mechanisms of, of exploiting people. And in one case, uh, commercial, in many cases actually, commercial concessions were very important. So for example, in the period in the Congo uh, of the so-called Congo Free State, when after the Belg after the um, Berlin Conference, when the European powers sort of divided up Africa, King Leopold II got the Congo as like a private property. What Leopold II did was 
he basically gave out enormous amounts of land as commercial concessions. So he gave them out to companies, the Kasai Trust or the Katanga Trust. And the, these two trusts in the north here up the Congo River uh, were given out to Belgian private companies to basically run uh, to extract rubber. Okay, so this, these were two of the worst, the most... In the south, you had more... You know, you had mining, you had plantations, but these, these, these concessions, these colonial concessions in the north were the ones that were extremely associated with all of this hideous uh, exploitation connected to rubber collection. Okay, so, so, so there, you know, this is like thinking about colonialism, but sort of zooming in on a very specific feature of colonialism that you can try to look at uh, the implication of. And, and, and how would I think about that kind of methodologically? Well, these concessions here have a very well-defined territory, okay? So, so you can think, if you think about the boundary, you know, you can think about comparing places that were impacted by the concessions and places that were not impacted by the concessions and sort of comparing them. And as long as those things were comparable, are comparable, that actually gives you a pretty powerful technique. So, you know, we were just discussing this over tea, that if you had a map of where the British expropriated land in Kenya, you'd be able, you'd have a well-defined boundary between uh, places that were outside and inside that map. And that would give you a kind of methodological approach, this regression discontinuity design is, what's the discontinuity? The discontinuity is at this boundary here. Okay, so, so that gives you a way of actually investigating what's the long-run consequences of, from the Congo Free State of creating these uh, concessions. Okay, so that's what, that's, what, uh, that's what Sarah and Eduardo did. Okay, so, so I think, you know, why focus on these commercial concessions? Well, there's lots of things you could focus on. Okay, so, so I think it's appealing because these things are so notorious of course, the fact that they're so notorious affects, you know, how we interpret this. You know, so a lot of our discussion so far methodologically is what, you know, people would say this is like what's called internal validity. You know, so internal validity is we focus on trying to estimate a convincing causal effect of something like this territory. But external validity is, well, how representative is this thing I'm going to use as, you know, how representative is this source of variation I'm going to use as a, as a measure of the general impact even of commercial concessions. You know, the fact that these commercial concessions were so incredibly violent and brutal might mean, well, actually, you know, this doesn't apply elsewhere. This is an estimate that only applies in this particular context. So that's, that's the question of external validity. We can talk more about that later. So the, we're focused today really on internal validity, but we could talk more about external validity. But I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about external validity myself. So, so let's, so this is what they're doing, okay? Uh, so, so, so how do I, you know, how do I know this is, is going to be a valid exercise? Well, does you read the paper? The paper is very rich. They spend a lot of time, basically arguing that these boundaries are essentially arbitrary. You know, the the King Leopold really didn't know very much about what went on up here in the 1880s and 1890s. So they usually just kind of match river, kind of natural features like river basins. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the thing is, of course, is going to be that, that, so there's two approaches to this. You know, one is just use historical information, try to understand how the concession was created and try to make an argument that, that you know, the boundary is pretty arbitrary. Okay. The second, which is more systematic, is, well, let's look at data. And we can compare data on either side of the boundary. That's called, like, balance. We're going to look for balance. And we're going to show you with observable data that these things look pretty similar. Okay? Of course, the ideal thing would be to have historical data, meaning before the Belgians created these concessions, did the, did the places that ended up on either side of the boundary look similar? But, of course, it's hard to get historical data from, from this part of the world. Uh, but you can get observables about, you know, geographical data. I'll show you that in a second. Okay? So, so really, the idea of this research... So, you know, here's the question. The question is, 
what's the long run development consequences of these colonial concessions. And the research design is really pretty intuitive, right? It's, it, it's like there's places that were hit by the concessions and places that were not hit. So essentially, I'm going to compare, I'm going to look at the boundary. Why the boundary? Well, because the idea is that, you know, if you're close to the boundary, that's the most comparable possible, right? So the boundary is here. I'm over here. You know, I'm treated by this rubber exploitation. The people over there don't get treated. Um, you might worry, like, wouldn't I want to run over there? That's called the no sorting at the boundary condition. So there's some technical things that they discuss a lot in the paper, but, 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 but let me not dwell on that for the moment. I just want to kind of emphasize here that, that to you, it's, a very, it's a very intuitive thing, this regression discontinuity design, okay? So, 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 and just kind of identifying situations where you can exploit it. You know, look at that boundary there, right? It's a straight line, okay? So straight lines in this context are great, right? Because it's just someone drew a line on a map. They didn't know anything. They just drew a line. So then that is, you couldn't get more arbitrary than that, right? Than drawing a line, okay? And these are river basins, all right? So, so light, straight lines are good. Of course, many African countries have straight lines uh, for boundaries, and we could come back to that too. Okay, so, 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 how, okay, so, so now I have this map, and I can digitize the map, and I can look at the long-run development consequences of uh, these concessions. How do I do that? What, what outcome variable do I use? Well, DHS geolocated data. So Professor Bautista was sort of saying, um, you know, one, you know, no, why, why did Nathan Nunn need this? Why did Le Nathan and Leonard need this Murdoch map? You have all this geocoded uh, DHS uh, data, you know, with ethnicity and things like that. But, but so what they do is they use the DHS data here, and this is just DHS kind of clusters, and th this is the digital boundaries of those two um, co concessions in the north of Congo. Here's the the, you know, the the Congo River going through the middle of it. Um, you know, and this is just, this is where the DHS data is. They have inside and outside those concessions, okay? So, so that's, you know, and how far outside? Well, they use here 100, up to 100 kilometers outside. So, so in this type of analysis, it's never really clear, like, how close to the boundary you should be. You know, should you be 10 kilometers or 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers? So mostly the way of doing these exercises just show robustness. You know, there are some, they have some ideas about optimal, the optimal bandwidth it's called, um, but, but there's no real agreement about that. So, 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 you know, 100 kilometers is completely arbitrary, but the main strategy is to vary that and show that the results are robust. At least that's the way I've always done it. Okay, so, and the, the, the econometric model, which is a very standard regression discontinuity design, is just, you know, on the left-hand side, they have some development outcome, which is going to be from the DHS, okay, contemporary DHS surveys, individual I in village V. So again, just like the paper that Professor Bautista talked about, this is a very kind of long-run exercise. Now, in the past, there was the slave trade, and today there's trust, okay? And a lot of the discussion was, well, what came in between? You know, like, how did that reproduce itself over time, okay? And... The same is going to happen here. You know, the, the explanatory variable is going to be basically a dummy if your village was inside the concession territories, okay? And then the outcome, and that's, you know, that's 120, 130 years ago. The outcome is some contemporary development outcome from the DHS, okay? But what's particularly nice about this paper is they actually put a lot of work into telling a story about what comes in between, okay? So, so the first part of the paper is just looking at this kind of long run uh, story. And then the second part, and you know, where they did this amazing data collection I'll talk about in Gemena, is understanding the mechanism. So that actually they get much further than Nunn and Wanchikon did in terms of understanding the mechanisms and understanding what comes in between this event and in the past and today, okay? But, you know, the way I always think about that is that's not a problem, that's a sort of research opportunity, understanding the mechanisms and how these things reproduce themselves. Okay, so this is very, you know, so they have these individual level covariates from the DHS, they have these fixed effects, there's lots of different sort of fixed ways of doing fixed effects here, 
but they just had a control for you know, the, the proximity to the nearest uh, con concession. Uh, and then this is what's called, you know, this thing here is called the running variable. It's just really, you know, typically a linear function of, you know, your kind of distance to the boundary, you know. So here, you know, there's, you know, you can think of the treatment, if I can start using that language, as, you know, it's really sort of geographical, you know. So, so I get into the boundary and then suddenly, bam, I'm in the boundary, you know, this dummy variable uh, switches on. And, you know, this variable here is just sort of controls in some sense the, the it just creates a kind of geographical, it just maps the geographical relationship between the observations and the, and the proximity of the boundary. Okay, so, 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 so how do I convince you that this research design is valid? I think it's obviously a really interesting question. So what about the research design? The historical stuff is important. The how did the boundaries get constructed, etc. But what's also important is balance. Okay, so so here they have within a hundred, like just comparing covariates inside and outside the boundary, just so that they show that they look similar. Okay, so within a hundred kilometers, hundred kilometers on either side, within fifty kilometers, you know, and then inside and outside. So they just look at the average covariates. You know, this is all a bunch of geographical stuff that you know, you can plausibly argue maybe was true before the concession was created. Uh, you know, I don't really have a hypothesis about <laughs> most of these things, but, but this is kind of what you do, you know, navigable river density. You know, again, you have this data on sort of disease environment, like malaria suitability. Um, uh, Marcella Alsan, for example, who's a um, professor at the Kennedy School, Harvard Kennedy School, wrote her dissertation, I was actually one of her thesis advisors, looking at kind of the long-run impact of the tsetse fly on development in Africa. So she, she's actually a medical doctor by training originally before she became an economist. She developed this way of estimating kind of, she had a very sophisticated model of like malaria suitability, uh, like what, what kind of ecological conditions uh, 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 does malaria f uh, kind of, um, you know, the Anopheles mosquito flourish in. You could do the same thing. She did the same thing with the tsetse fly. Um, you know, distance to Kinshasa. I guess it wasn't so important. You know, distance to Kinshasa in 1885 wasn't wasn't so important. Uh, and they also, you know, they look at slave trade to the extent they can do it. You know, that's pretty crude. Uh, and then they use some data here from this ethnographic atlas. So I just I, the reason I pointed that out in Professor Bautista's regression is that I, I knew it was going to come up here. So. This was, you know, this information, some of it, you know, in the, in the Belgian, is collected pretty early in the Belgian colonial uh, period by ethnographers, you know. So, for example, if you look at the Kuba Kingdom that I was talking about yesterday, uh, the first, you know, real ethnographic survey of the Kuba people by Joyce and Torday is like 1909. So, it's not too, it's not too, you know, it's pretty close to when these concessions were created, okay? So, so this is an index of political centralization, you know, to what extent the, the ethnographic atlas has a variable about how politically centralized different societies were. You know, I was talking about Uganda, south of Uganda, you have all these states, very centralized, north of Uganda, you know, very, you know, you don't have these politically centralized societies. So that measures that, that's measured systematically in the ethnographic atlas. Here is, you know, whether or not there's polygamy. So I think this is just stuff you can, you can measure. Uh, and the ethnographic atlas also has one variable about kind of leadership selection. You know, so how were, to the extent that there were leaders or chiefs, how were they selected? Okay, so, so the point of this table is not, you know, not that any of these things are kind of necessarily intrinsically important. It's just to try to show that whatever we can measure here is very similar inside and outside. Uh, and then, you know, what this last uh, column here does is basically like it runs a regression. It, it runs, you know, let me just, you know, if I give you an example, it runs this regression, but instead of having you know, the development outcome that we're ultimately interested in on the left-hand side, it has one of these covariates, okay? So, so it just sort of looks at, you know, do, does the covariate jump at the boundary, okay? So, so I run that regression with, for example, you know, um, how politically centralized, whoops, how politically centralized 
uh, the society was. And the fact that this coefficient here, minus 0.04, is statistically insignificant shares, shows that at the boundary, there's no significant jump in how politically centralized peoples are. So this is just a kind of very standard way of doing these balance exercise. You take these covariates and you estimate the same type of regression discontinuity model. Okay. Um, all right, so, so here's the first results where you look at development outcomes using the, the DHS. So what do they find? Well, inside the, inside the boundary, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's significantly fewer years of education. Uh, literacy is significantly lower. There's a wealth index, which they have in the DHS, kind of combining you know, different assets you might own, bicycle, etc. what condition your house, what sort of materials your house is made out of. Wealth is significantly lower inside the boundary of the concessions, um, etc. You know, uh, this is about, you know, height, height and height age. So it's about kind of, you know, and child, you know, so these are about health outcomes in some sense. Um, so so wh wherever you look, Places inside the boundary uh, are, are less developed, if you like. Although I hate that word, developed. Don't you hate that word, developed? Like, I hate that word. Let's, I, I promise not to use it anymore. Okay. So, so, and here's these. These are these regression discontinuity plots. Okay. So, 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 you know, let's, uh, you know, and and what do you see here? Well, you see, you know, you see. Here's the estimated relationship up until the boundary, and then I go into the boundary that jumps down, okay? So that jump is, you know, that's the size of the coefficient on this, on this, on this, on that, on that dummy variable. And then, you know, here's the linear function, this, what I call the running variable, and then they just, you know, they allow that, that's, you know, you can interact that with the dummy so that it has a different slope on different sides of the, of the discontinuity, okay? But the idea is to show, you know, and often you just see in the raw data, this one is like not so clear as some types of studies, uh, that you know here always there's a jump down okay in 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 this sort of showing that that there's some discontinuous fall in all these development ah oh, I said it again all of these um, prosperity outcomes at the boundary okay and that's plausibly associated with the concession why because what else is jumping there okay so so the the real kind of so the really important assumption you know, is that nothing else is jumping at that point. The only thing that's jumping is you go from outside the concession to inside the concession, okay? And, and, and you know, if when, you, when you read the paper, you see that, like in our Cuba paper, where we spend a lot of time at the start convincing you that there's a natural experiment there, and once I convince you of that, then I can run some very straightforward ordinary least square regression that's kind of what's happening here, okay? There's no complicated econometrics here. It's all setting the stage, you know? It's like, that's, that's, it's all, um, that's, 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 that's it. Okay, so, so now, okay, I met, great. Uh, but what about the mechanisms, okay? So, so we, you know, we had a great discussion about the mechanisms uh, with this trust thing. Uh, they get a lot further into this. What, what did they do? Well, yesterday I was talking about how we went to Kananga uh, and they went to Gemena. So here's Gemena, and you can see Gemena. So, so the Gemena is uh, just inside the boundary. Didn't exist at the time uh, of, it's a, it's a kind of, it emerged in the colonial period. And they went to Gemena and they collected uh, data, basically, from lots of people, and they plotted their villages. And you see, like, you know, like the way we, we co collected this retrospective information on people's villages They're in Kananga, but people typically have these connections to the villages. Maybe they grew up in the village and they migrated, or their parents still live in the village, or they have some ancestral village. So they map the villages, and now you have villages inside the concessions and outside the concessions. So, so what they do is they collected this individual level data, and they tried to tell a story about how come you know, there may be a persistent effect of these concessions on development outcomes in Congo today? Uh, and here's how, did, here's how they tell the story. So they tell a great story. What's the story? How, is this, how do these mechanisms work? It's sort of institutional. How did the Belgians exploit the Congolese people? Indirectly. So 
they didn't have a huge bureaucracy collecting rubber there. They stationed Europeans at various stations in these concessions, and then they worked through chiefs, local chiefs. Local chiefs had to deliver the rubber. Of course, the chiefs were heavily penalized if they didn't deliver the rubber. But what the Belgians did, similarly to British all over, British colonial Africa, was that they pushed people into power who they, think would who they thought would collaborate with them. Okay? So, so when you read the paper and they talk about the historical evidence, there's this idea that what these concessions did was they created an awful lot of illegitimate political authority at the local level. Okay? So how do they show that? Well, this is all running regressions on data that they collected in Gemena. So they asked people about you know, what goes on in your village, what about the chief? How is the chief selected? How is public good provision? And you see that uh, in places which were the concession, where there was a concession, people report, uh, they, people report that public good provision is worse. They, they report that it's far less likely that the chief is elected. So the, there's a lot of variation. There's a kind of, I could talk about this next week because we were actually doing work together in Gemena, but, but there's, a lot of, there's a lot of variation at the local level in Congo on how chiefs come to power, whether they're hereditary, whether they're elected. Okay? Uh, you know, lower welfare you know, according, to according to different measures. Okay? So, so the story that they have is, well, the Belgians created these chiefs, these illegitimate chiefs, often hereditary chiefs, uh, who were much less accountable to people, and they're still there today. That's perpetuated itself over time. Okay? But then they tell a kind of really interesting story about the reaction of society to that, which you're going to see is very different from the Nun and Wanchikon story, because they also collected information on trust. Here comes trust again. What do you find inside the concession? Well, uh, if anything, it's not significant here because, you know, this is again, you know, what's, how, you, how are you varying these things? Well, it depends on this bandwidth, okay. So, but if I use the wide, this is a 100 kilometer bandwidth, I find a positive correlation, okay. So, trust is higher in the concession than outside. And they also collect survey information on kind of sharing norms or norms of reciprocity. And they actually show that within the concessions, uh, people are more in favor of sharing. Okay? So, so they tell a fascinating story, which is very different from the Nun and Wanchikon paper. So Nun and Wanchikon have this idea that the slave trade you know, devastated African society and it undermined trust in this persistent way. What they find here, in some sense, and the story they tell is that the colonial rubber concessions, uh, you know, and this is this, you know, which might have been even worse than the slave trade, created a long-run negative effect through the sort of institutionalization of indirect rule, which is how the rubber was collected. But society tried to compensate. Okay, society tried to compensate for this exploitation and for this illegitimate rule by somehow, you know, becoming more solidaristic or something, you know, by, by trusting each other more, by, by, by be sharing. So, so it, it sort of goes in the opposite direction, you know. So my question is, why didn't the slave trade do that? You know, why, why is it in this case exploit, colonial exploitation sort of creates a reaction, a positive reaction in society, that's their interpretation, whereas that didn't happen with the slave trade. So I think that's a, that's, you know, um, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting, uh, it's a really interesting finding. And you could also say it contrasts with, you know, with the Cuba Kingdom paper also, because in the Cuba Kingdom, we find that, you know, state institutions sort of crowd out uh, social norms in some sense. But here, you could say, well, they're very different sorts of institutions. Here, you know, the Cuba Kingdom was obviously a much more legitimate institution than, than the type of things that the Belgian colonists were creating. But, but I think, you know, what these papers show is that, and I think, you know, it's related to the work that on Italy, that, so you're probably sitting there thinking, what the heck are they talking about Italy for? I don't care about Italy. Uh, but, but the same kind of, ins it, these issues come up. There's a very rich research topic here, this interaction between, you know, between 
political institutions, between formal institutions and society, social capital, social norms. It's a very active research area. And I think these papers, if you take them together and you think about them together, they generate quite a few puzzles in terms of like, how do we understand, how does society react to these different things? How does society react to these institutions? Okay. And, and so that's, you know, that's, 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 that's what I have to say about that. Uh, let me just say one thing parenthetically that I was going to say earlier, but then I forgot to say, which is that, and this will become very clear next week, which is that a lot of this research, you know, here is sort of fo focused on, you know, um, trying to understand the long run development trajectory of Africa. Okay. And so, you know, it's a fact well known to every development economist that African countries are relatively poor compared to other parts of the world. And so a lot of this literature is focused on trying to understand why that is, you know, what type of historical processes have created these problems in Africa today. But the future doesn't have to be like the past. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. You know, if we were sitting in China in 1978, you know, we'd have found lots of reasons for why China was a development disaster, you know, of like in every single dimension, okay? So, so, so this is sort of understanding the past, but I think it's always very important to think and realize that the past doesn't determine the future. You know, Africans determine the future. Uh, the past may have shaped institutions and norms, and, but institutions change and norms change and culture changes. And so I don't, I don't want you to kind of think that, oh gosh, isn't this all like super depressing? You know, no, it's, it's, it's social science. You know, we're trying to understand why the world is the way it is. But, but, but the future doesn't have to be like the past. And I think that's very important to understand, no? Okay. All right. So, so uh, how long do I have? Okay, great, great, great. Plenty of time. Okay, so I went, I went over this paper very fast, but, but I think this paper is like a really, really good paper, like uh, to study. You know, like I get my PhD students to read this paper very carefully because it's beautifully designed. You know, they set this, like it's a super interesting puzzle. You know, everyone knows about King Leopold and all of this carnage that went on in Congo. Nobody's ever written a paper about it. Uh, you know, everyone knows about Mau Mau, the Mau Mau rebellion, but nobody's ever written an empirical paper about Mau Mau. You know, everybody knows about Ujamaa, you know, but nobody's written an empirical paper about Ujamaa. Or everybody knows about the, the Maji Maji rebellion in Tanzania against the Germans. But what were the consequences of that? So I just think, like, I'm you know, once you start thinking about that, you, there's a lot of things like this in Africa that people haven't investigated okay so 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 you know you set the stage you ask a beautiful question like and you, oh who can deny that's important and then you set the empirical stage for like how you're going to investigate this why this is a plausible research design you use the history your knowledge of the institutions the statistics you know the balance table and then you do something simple okay so so you know complicated econometrics never compensates for a bad research design you know, and if you get the right research design, something simple is extremely convincing. So, so, and then this stuff about the mechanisms is, you know, is fabulous. You know, and, and it's much, they got much more into this than Nunn and Wanchikon did. The Nunn and Wanchikon paper is a great paper, but, but, but I think like the structure of it where, you know, you set the stage, you do the research design, you look at this long run effect, and then you get into these mechanisms. It's a very nice model of a, of a paper, I think. Okay, so here's another nice model of a paper with a different research design uh, by our colleague at Chicago in the Harris School, Raul Sanchez de la Sierra. Okay, here's a guy we should, we should get out to the AERC. Uh, so he's been working for over 10 years in the Eastern DRC, and he works a lot with warlords, like literally. He's been doing, he's been collecting data with this one armed group in Walikali territory in, in Eastern, in South Kivu, for over 10 years now, he's created this incredible data set of, he has all their finances, he has a record of all the people they recruit, who dies, what do they leave, and he's been like surveying a lot of them to understand why people join these rebel groups in some sense. So he's very deeply involved in this, and this was his PhD dissertation where he used this information he was collecting and a lot of retrospective information to look at a very famous hypothesis in social science about the origin of states.
So this goes back to a, an idea that Mansa Olsen had about, he has what he calls a stationary bandit. And Mansa Olsen's idea was that, the, you know, who, who are states? You know, where do states come from? You know, uh, Thomas Hobbes in his book Leviathan, you know, or John Locke had this idea, you know, that there was a sort of social contract and people come together, you know, and they decide to build state institutions, you know, could happen, and it has, has happened. But Mansa Olsen's idea was actually, you know, the real way that states happen is like some warlord or some bandit, as he called it, suddenly becomes more state-like, okay? So what does that mean? Well, they become stationary in Olsen's terminology, okay? So, so, so it's the title of the paper has this stationary bandits. They become stationary, what do they mean? They occupy a territory. You know, when we think about states, we think of states, institutions occupying a particular territory. They become more state-like. What does that mean? They start collecting taxes. They start building institutions, maybe fiscal institutions. They try to get the support of people. Maybe they become less violent. Maybe they, since they're sitting in the same place, they start thinking it's more valuable to do things here, which are enduring, to build public goods, to build infrastructure. So his, what he tries to look at is basically the incentive to become more state-like with these rebel groups. When do these rebel groups become stationary, meaning they stay in the same place, they start raising taxes, they become more state-like, okay? And what could determine that? So Olson's view was completely economic, okay? It's just materialistic factors. If it becomes economically attractive to stay in the same place, you do it, okay? So that's his, uh, his hypothesis. And his hypothesis in particular is that it's the dynamics of commodity prices that affect these incentives, okay? And so if suddenly the coltan price goes through the roof, then it becomes really attractive to control territory with coltan mines. Okay, so, you know, and here's the natural experiment, you could say, which is, here's the price of coltan, this is the price of, um, yes, the coltan price. This is the coltan price. I think there's a, I don't, I don't, yeah, so, yeah. I'm confused. Yeah, this, the black thing is the coltan price. Oh, yes. Okay. There's the U.S. coal ton price and the DLC coal ton price. Right. So, so here's the natural experiment, if you like, which is this massive increase in coal ton prices. So his idea is that this is completely exogenous to the Congo, right? This is just Nintendo introduce a new game station, which, which, and you need coal ton to build the Nintendo. I don't know why you need coal ton, but you do. So, so that's... That's, complete, that's like completely exogenous to DRC, but, so that's good. Uh, it's not, but it, it, it's not, you know, this is not some, you could imagine, oh, coltan expands, it drives the price down or whatever, you know. So, so, so Congo is a big player in the world, <laughs> uh, coltan. I think like most of the world's coltan comes from, from Congo, in fact. So you, you, you might be worried about market power or whatever. So the paper sort of tries to convince you that this, is, this, is, this shock is completely exogenous, and it's an enormous increase, you can see, in the coltan price. Uh, it's transitory because it turns out that Nintendo decides not to build this game station in the end anyway, but it's an enormous shock, and he's interested in what's the impact of that on... The, the, the incentives and behavior of these rebel groups, okay? He's also compare, he also compares it to the price of gold, okay? And that's interesting, too, as a sort of reality check on the story, okay? Because if you read the paper, he sort of says, well, coltan is this bulky thing, okay? So you need to control the mines. But controlling a gold mine doesn't doesn't help you because you can just put gold in your pocket. You can't monitor production of gold. People find gold. There's a lot of alluvial gold mining or you know what they call artisanal gold mining. Really difficult to control. Okay. So then, if the price of gold goes up, you don't want to control the mines. You want to control where the people are spending the money from the from the gold. Okay. So so that that's a sort of that's a very nice reality check on on the story. The, the, the difference in the commodity ha creates very different incentives of where you want to control, okay? So, so, and here's where he collected data from in North and South Kivu. You know, you might ask, 
like how on earth did he collect data? You know, in the bush in North and South Kivu, you know, infrastructure is really terrible. Uh, well, what he did was he trained in Goma a lot of Congolese enumerators and then sent them out on motorbikes in, 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 into the bush, basically. Uh, and this, this map is just kind of showing, uh, he makes a distinction, you know, along the lines that I already kind of motivated between two types of, pla well, there's various types of places, but there's, there's mines, you know, there's, there's coltan mines and there's um, gold, gold mines, and then there's what he calls support villages, okay? So, so they, you know, it's a bit hard to see on this thing, but these, these, these mines mark, um, uh, they mark out villages which are close to coltan mines or gold mines, and also a control group, okay? So he needs a control group, uh, wh which is, you know, villages which are not near coltan or gold mines. Okay, so, so, and then this is where he collects, so this is also an incredible data collection exercise. Alex is going to complain that you need a lot of money to do this, uh, and, and, but, but we're going to talk about some very cheap res re research designs next week in response to your comment from yesterday. Uh, uh, but, but the deeper point is, you know, find ways for African scholars to collaborate with, 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 with Western scholars who have money. Uh, this was all fun. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, we, we, we have to work on that. Okay, so th this, is, this, is the, this is the context, you know. So, so again, you know, this is just, you get a lot of credit for doing something with this, at this level of ambition. Uh, how did he manage to do this, actually? It's quite interesting, you know. The, the reason he managed to do this is that he was hired as a research assistant for this evaluation of so-called Tungane, which was this enormous community-driven development policy that the British government implemented, $10 million in Eastern DRC. So he trained the Congolese people who collected the data for the British government in Tungane. So then he had a whole team of people ready for his dissertation. So he was able to kind of leverage the, 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 the DFID project in order to kind of build infrastructure and also, you know, build relationships with the Congolese people in order to collect the, dis the, the, the data of his dissertation. Okay, so, so the empirical model, you know, is, you know, what you call a kind of very conventional difference, a difference model. So he has, you know, some, some dependent variable here which is going to capture how state-like, you know, behavior is as a particular... Um, uh, you know, in a particular location, in a particular village. Uh, and that's mostly dummies, you know, like when, they, when he sent these people out into these villages, what they did was they collected retrospective information on the behavior of these different armed groups. So the enumerators asked local people to talk about how these groups behaved, okay? And, you know, did they collect taxes? You know, what did they do? Did they terrorize people? Did they commit acts of violence? So from that, he tries to create dummy variables, with, you know, co corresponding to, you know, was this group attempting to tax people's output? You know, were they a stationary bandit? So he, that's a little crude, but he tries to condense a lot of information and sort of say, Okay, this group is taxing, it's kind of providing order, particularly order and security in the village. It's behaving like a stationary bandit, like a little state, okay? So, you know, security services, you know, he, he looks at some other stuff, you know, for example, did they provide dispute resolution? Like, so these villages typically have chiefs, you know, or other types of institutions who would resolve disputes, but then he asks, did these, you know, did these, did these armed groups get into judicial... Uh, start doing judicial administration, okay? So, so you have this very, you know, so there's fixed effects, you know, there's fixed effects at, the, at this kind of village level. You have time effects. Yesterday we were, we were saying that Kimuli Kasara's study is a little non-standard because, you know, she has a panel data set up, but she doesn't have time effects. And going to contrast what he does with what she does is that she starts with a much too complicated model, okay? So, so this is something I guess that's coming across is that the conventional sort of state of the art is you start with a very parsimonious setup, you know, in some sense. You're just interested in two things, you know? So here, you're interested in 
the impact of the coltan price or perhaps the gold price on whether or not these warlords, these bandits become stationary. Okay, that's the dependent variable and the independent variable. And forget the covariates, okay? So in the non Wanchikon thing, it's trust and slavery. Yes, there's covariates, but it's just like, yes, 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 yes. It's, you know, it's not, it's not the focus at all. You, it, the, you focus on the story, you know. So, so, so this very parsimonious way of doing things, this, you know, this is like, this is how you do the state of the art. Time effects, the, the fixed effects, and here's the, you know, what's the difference in the difference? Well, CJ is just, you know, a dummy variable if there's a coltan mine near village J, uh, um, these are just, you know, this is the price of coltan uh, over time. Here's the price of gold over time. And GJ is just a dummy, which is one if there's a gold mine. Okay, so, so, so that's, that's, that's the idea, okay? And, you know, he, so, that's, that's, so this is just a very straightforward regression. You can see that there's basically no covariates here at all. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he's interested in, you know, uh, whether or not you become, a, so here's the interaction between the coltan price and this CJ variable, whether or not, and what, what he shows is that, you know, that when the coltan price goes up in a place where there's a coltan mine, the state, you become more, these groups become more state-like, okay? They, they become like a stationary bandit, all right? They provide more security, etc. and there's, there's some sorts of taxes. But if you look at the gold price, and here's the gold price, you don't see that at all, okay? So, so when, when the gold price goes up, if the village is next to a gold mine, nothing happens, okay? Why is that? Because you can't, you can't tax the gold. So, so there's no incentive to try to control territory with a gold mine, because people have just put the gold in their socks and, and you, can't, you can't monitor them, okay? But instead what you see is that in a village, you know, in villages which are not near a mine, then you have an effect, okay? So, so you want to control where people are spending the money because where they're spending the money, you can tax the business people, there's an incentive to provide security because that's where the wealth is gonna be. You can't monitor people mining it, but you can somehow control where they spend it, okay? So, so this, 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 and that, this is it, you know. So again, here, there's an enormous amount of effort in the data collection and sort of conceptualizing the thing, okay? If you read the introduction, you see that there's all these big themes in social science. These are great questions, but there's absolutely no evidence on this, okay? And he realized this was a context where you could collect evidence uh, on, you know, on, on this very big question in social science. Now, you might say, so what? Okay, did that make people better off? You know, in public finance, when we talk about the state, we sort of say, well, private individuals have a hard difficult, have a hard job, you know, providing public goods. So, you know, if we all collectively provide public goods, there's a free rider problem, you know, we tend to undersupply public goods. So one of the reasons that the state emerges is to provide public goods. It makes people better off. So, so the, 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 there's two real questions. So this is the first part of the paper, but the second part of the paper is, okay, did, did this make people better off? <laughs> that, you know, so, 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 and here's the answer, okay? So how do I measure whether people are better off? Difficult, okay? So there's no survey data here. He had to get his team of people to collect information. So one thing he did, which is sort of interesting, is like look at the number of weddings. But, and you have to, you see, here the trick is you have to collect, you're collecting this retrospective information. So it has to be simple, right? So I can't come to you and say, you know, how much savings did you have in the bank nine years ago? You know, if you ask me, you'll have no idea, you know. And of course, there's no bank here either. So, so no one has, you know, so, so I have to find, you know, I have to find a question I can ask people where they remember the answer. But you probably do remember if your daughter got married nine years ago or your son got married six years ago. So he asked people about marriages. But marriages is important, right, because bride wealth is very big here. So you can't get married unless you have bride wealth. So like the Congolese people that we have, you know, who've worked for us as enumerators, if you ask them, the men, you know, what are you going to do with the money we're paying you? Oh, I'm saving up to get married, you know, saving up for bride wealth. So, so actually, Marriages is a really good statistic of wealth, 
Okay, so 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 you see, it's it's a it's a it's a clever it's a very clever it's a very clever variable actually because it's very precise to measure retrospectively. Everyone knows when their children got married or when they got married, and he finds what does he find? Okay, so let me just talk talk through this. Okay, so this is the CJs is Coltan dummy interacted with the Coltan price. Okay, so Coltan price times. CJ times PJ times stationary bandit. That's his stationary bandit dummy. Okay, so here's stationary bandit times army. Okay, so what, what on earth would that mean? Well, some of the stationary bandits are actually not bandits. They're Congolese army units. <laughs> what a surprise. Okay, so, so there's a lot of, you know, so when they collected the information, and people started talking about you know, these groups and these armed groups and the behavior of these armed groups. It turned out that some of these armed groups were Congolese, basically you know, military regiments or whatever. So then he incorporates that into the analysis. And so here, this is like looking for heterogeneity, stationary bandit, and actually part of the Congolese army. And this is one of the most interesting variables, which is what he calls militia. And militia is, is the stationary bandit from your local, like locals, in some sense? Okay, so you might think there's a big difference between an armed group coming to your village who are, you know, who are from far away, or a local armed group. So militia is a dummy which is won if the armed group are basically locals. Okay, so so if you look at the number of weddings, for example, you see that actually, you know, the direct effect of the Coltan price seems to be positive, but what's really interesting here is that if the armed group is a stationary bandit and is, a lo is local, then it has consistent positive effects on all these different ways of measuring welfare. Okay, so, so there's more in the paper. So one of the conclusions of the story is that it's, having a stationary bandit is good, but only if they're locals. Okay. In fact, you can see that you know the coefficient on stationary bandit just on its own, or the coefficient on stationary bandit when they're in the army. You know, you may not be terribly surprised that the Congolese army uh, doesn't do much for people's welfare uh, when they become more stationary. But when local people come, you know, and so this is interesting because this is something totally new. You could say the first part of the paper is kind of the first empirical evidence that this conjecture of Mansa Olson's, you know, in a very particular context, okay? So back to my distinction between internal validity and external validity. In a very particular context, uh, Mansa Olson's hypothesis kind of is borne out that when the material incentives uh, increase, you get more state-like behavior, behavior. Even that, add something to Olson's idea, right? Because Olson, you read his paper, he doesn't distinguish between things like gold and coltan. So it all depends on the technology and the nature of the source of wealth and how controllable it is, okay? So that's an interesting addition to the social science. And, you know, this is something, again, that, that, nobody, uh, that nobody conjectures. So, so what's great about this paper is that it's not just that he takes an idea, you know, a big idea in social science and presents evidence consistent with it, but actually the analysis adds a lot of things that nobody had thought about before, you know. And you could say, well, maybe this is just the African, this is an African thing, you know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, you know. Needs conceptualizing, needs um, thinking about, okay. Um, all right. Um, so, so, you know, just to say, we could talk more about this next week, that, you know, he's just, this is a sort of difference and difference research design. You know, you have this shock, you have this kind of external shock. Uh, uh, this external shock interacts with places which are heterogeneous, you know, places that have a coal time mine, places that don't have a coal time mine, places that have a gold mine, places that don't. And then you look at how the shock affects the difference between those places. You know, you look before and after uh, the impact of the shock on you know the difference between places that have a coal time mine and those that those that don't. Okay, so the shock differentially impacts the places 
which have a coltan mine. So I, the, the research design looks at the difference before and the difference after the shock. So the difference and the di between the difference and the difference. Okay, I'm, I, I feel like I'm saying that in a very confusing way, but we'll we'll come back to it. Okay, so I think I think that that's. That's, you know, that's the agenda today. We talked about these kind of three very big research designs. You know, if you pick up a copy you know, of the American Economic Review, you'll see that basically every paper either has, empirical paper has instrumental variable regression, it has differences in difference, it has a regression discontinuity, or it has an explicit randomization. And, and we're gonna talk about that next week. Um, I have an announcement, but let's leave okay. that for after. Yeah. Okay. What, what time? What time is this? It's four fifty-seven. Okay. Oh, oh, we have three entire minutes <laughs> <laughs> of questions. Uh, so I think I think what we're going to do, you know, is keep driving home these these approaches, you know. But again, the question is the questions is the important thing, and then you get the question. And then you map it into one of these research designs. I think that's a very good way of thinking kind of about how to do kind of successful empirical projects. Okay. And we had great ideas in the tea break. I'm gonna to go to the National Archive and look for colonial maps. <laughs> Okay, why don't you make your announcement? So I organized the, the respondents to the presentations. Okay, so I have Lanta will be presenting on what inhibit role women usage of financial services available in their mobile phones. And Moses, you'll be, you'll be, what? Come, what do you mean, why? <laughs> I'm sure she is. <laughs> and I guess we should keep this order, yes. Um, okay. Uh, Melab Citati, you will be commenting on Ambrose. Yes. So Ambrose will be presenting what are the social and economic barriers to the performance of schools in Uganda? And in the Dropbox folder, you have the first attempt, like that, that assignment that I, that I request, that we requested. In the Dropbox folder that I sent to you, you will find all of the files. So you can prepare in advance for, for the comments tomorrow. Okay? Um, okay. Dennis, you will be presenting on enhance, well, you, Enhance the access of the poorest parts of the society in digital services by designing an inclusive financial services. That's more or less what you want to do, right? And blessing, will you will be commenting on Dennis, all right? Blessing, sorry, sorry. Uh, John Caranja, how does regulatory framework affect the growth of domestic trade? And Lydia Sheruto will be commenting on, on, on John, okay? Cecilia Pereruan, Na Naeku. Uh, strengthening social protection institutions and systems in a developed system of governments. Isabella, you'll be commenting on, okay? Alex will be presenting on sustaining fiscal consolidation efforts in Kenya and South Africa. And Ruth, is, I try to match you based on your interest. S sometimes it's not a perfect match, but you're both doing fiscal things, right? <laughs> Why did you give me that look? Okay, so Ruth will be commenting to Alex. Um, Mela Citati will be presenting on the contribution of school and non-school environment on pupil performance. Um, and Ambrose will be commenting to Mela, okay? And Isab Isabella Mwangi will be presenting on welfare impact of electricity sector reforms in Kenya. 
and Cecilia will be your commenter or commentator. How do you say that? A uh, commentator. Okay. Discussant. You're discussant. Thank you. Yes. It's my exactly. It's my Spanish translation. So Ruth will be presenting on assess fiscal sustainability and estimate a fiscal reaction function in Kenya. Alex will be com the discussant. Um, Lydia will be presenting on what are the impacts of institutional system and resource capacity on the gross country output. And John will be, John Karanja will be the, the discussant. And finally, Moses will be presenting, you have to pick or pl Okay, I mean, you could throw the two ideas, but you have ten, the same amount of time. You have to be really efficient and precise. <laughs> um, Dennis will be, you, you will be comment, discussing his papers. Okay. If, if you change, what? Huh? Am I missing anyone? So maybe I put twice that. Huh? <laughs> Who is not the ah okay? <laughs> and you're not presenting? Okay, so I have to change that, but I'll 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 make an announcement. So I'm missing you, you, and you. As a discussant, and I didn't. Okay, so I'll I'll update that because we don't have time. But I'll do that, and I'll send any a proper email with the matching. The file is in the Dropbox folder that you all have access to. So when I announce it, you will be able to access and make sure that everything is correct. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> yes, you, you do both, you both do fiscal things, right? Yes, yes. No, no, it's not the same topic, but, but you're both interested in fiscal policy. So I thought it could be a good match to have someone who knows about your topic. Okay, let me let me go through the assignments again and I'll correct it and then I'll send it to you. Okay? Online robot online and for the people online I have to do uh, still do it. So I'll do it this afternoon and I'll send it tonight. Okay? Okay. What time is the presentation? Nine, nine. Nine. Oh, we, we haven't yet. have presentations make sure you share them with research or first thing in the morning this team please bring your presentations share their presentations with them in fact are the online uh, student are the online uh, pre uh, presenting okay so friday morning Maybe the comments on the student, yeah, preparation, oh, like, and the yeah. discussions, yeah, and then we lecture again.